Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please sit. His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, President of the Republic of Guyana, Right Honorable Mr. Tony Blair, former Prime Minister of Britain, Mr. Ashney Singh, Dr. Ashney Singh, Minister of Finance, Honorable Dr. Jane Miller, High Commissioner to Britain, and all other dignitaries and high commissioners present here today. Baroness, Amos, and Mrs. David Lamy, Honorable MP David Lamy. This morning, we are gathered here to witness a wonderful conversation about the environment and Guyana. I will, of course, dispense with the lengthy uh, salutations that I should give because the people who are in this room are many, they are high quality, and they all, by name, should be acknowledged. However, it's a tight program, and I've been put on a tight leash, so I will ask your forgiveness by not mentioning everybody who's here. Um, I'd like to thank all of those attending in person and joining online for this e exciting event where we will officially inaugurate the Sophia Point Rainforest Research Center. And we will hear from two very special guests. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for the President and Mr. Blair. David, Nicholas, Sam, and the rest of the Sophia Point team have been in close conversation with the University of Guyana since 2020, as the idea behind Sophia Point has evolved into reality. This is a not-for-profit research center, and we want to thank them for their efforts. We are gathered to reflect on that progress today and to celebrate the contribution it can make to our students here at the university and to the wider understanding and ultimately the protection of Guyana's environment. This is an important milestone. And as we all know, Guyana's environment is globally important. I am delighted that we are joined by the Right Honorable Mr. David Lamy, Envoy Ex Extraordinary to the University of Guyana's Council British MP, and most of all, co-founder of Sophia Point. We will first hear some remarks from David on the establishment and progress of Sophia Point before inviting our honest guests to the stage for a conversation to reflect on Guyana's unique environment. But first, please let's enjoy a video that we would like to share with you to set the scene and provide context for Honorable Mr. Lamy's remarks. Please enjoy the video. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and the global spread of pandemics. Humanity has never faced challenges of their combined scale and severity, threatening our health, our economies, and the planet we call home. But there is a natural solution which can help tackle all three, the rainforest. The Sophia Point project will establish Guyana's first truly accessible wildlife and rainforest research centre. It will conserve 40 acres of pristine rainforest in Guyana, South America, serving as a training centre and field site for academics and students and a pillar of cutting edge science for the international community. Sophia Point will transform research in the region, adding Guyana to the map of world leading science and conservation delivering advances vital in the fight against climate change, biodiversity loss and protection of the rainforest. Destruction of the rainforest means carbon emissions released, ecosystems weakened and habitats lost. 
Slashing wild habitats increases the risk of zoonotic diseases like the coronavirus emerging. Now more than ever, we urgently need more research to understand the cause of these epidemics. To analyse rainforests' incredible genetic diversity, which could hold the key to vaccines and medicines of the future. Protecting wildlands, like Guyana's rainforests, can help stave off the next global outbreak. Sophia Point will bring leaders in climate change science, forest ecology and genetics to Guyana to study and help protect the rainforests, unlocking its solutions. Partnering with local Amerindian communities and Guyanese research, Sophia Point will help build the capacity of Guyana's next generation of decision makers, ensuring their voices are heard and they play a part in realising a more sustainable planet. Guyana is one of the most vulnerable countries on earth to the effects of climate change. Through Sophia Point, we have the opportunity to better understand, protect and champion Guyana's vitally important rainforest, helping to secure a future for our planet that is both sustainable and equitable. Sophia Point will be the last outpost on the edge of the rainforest, on the front line in our fight against climate change. Sophia Point Rainforest Research Centre can be a beacon of hope for biodiversity and protection of the rainforest when it's needed most. It is our opportunity to tell a better story for the future. Will you be part of it? Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Right Honorable David Lamy, co-founder with his wife, Nicola, of Sophia Point. Well, Thank you very much indeed, Vice-Chancellor. It's wonderful to be back um, in Guyana, the country of my parents' birth, and I can't tell you how excited I am to be here with my old boss and mentor, the great Tony Blair. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and the global spread of pandemics. And of course, to be here with my good friend, the President of Guyana. Thank you for your stewardship. Thank you so much. I just have one confession to make. The President had asked me to join the dinner with Tony Blair last night. Sadly, the plane arrived a little late. My parents would be very upset that I miss the goat curry and the roti. But I hope I can have a pepper pot with Mr. Blair a little later on. Let me also recognize dear friends who are with us. Uh, Dr. Ashley Singh, thank you so much for joining us. Major General Joe Singh, thank you so much. And of course, the great beloved friend of Guyana, Baroness Valerie Amos. Thank you. We're here to celebrate Guyana, to celebrate the incredible environment that Guyana represents, and to inaugurate the Sophia Point Rainforest Research Center. As I've said, I am beloved of this country because it's the country of my parents' birth. I've been coming back to Guyana several times a year since the age of 18. I understand this unique culture and the beauty that this country holds. Whilst, of course, my day job is as a UK politician, currently as the shadow foreign secretary in the UK, I've always felt a deep connection with this country the country of my heritage, and hope that one day I would be able to give something back. Being appointed envoy 
by the Vice-Chancellor, and the Chancellor was very special. And I recognize that the young people bursting with opportunity and imagination and education in this great institution often had a desire to understand and explore the world around them. But accessing the rainforest and the environment is not always straightforward. I was privileged to visit the Sophia Point area on the Essequibo, and I knew instantly that there was enormous, enormous potential for something very excited. That was over four years ago. And I'm very grateful for the vision of two people who are also with us. My wife, Nicola Green, Chair of Trustees of the Sophia Point Charity. John Paledri, also co-founder of Sophia Point Charity. Dr. Priya Maharaj and Rennie Edwards, both on our trustee board. And we've begun to turn that into a reality guided by the hard work and dedication of our centre director, Sam Airy, and his fiancée, Miranda. On this journey, we've been spurred by the enthusiasm and excitement at every level across the country for what Sophia Point could represent, a space for young Guyanese to be inspired and to inspire others, to better understand and protect the vitally important rainforest and to equip themselves with the knowledge and skills to champion their environment for generations to come. At its heart, Sophia Point is about building capacity in this great country. If you look around the globe at comparable countries, you can see what the standard is. Costa Rica, a country four times smaller than Guyana, has 44 research stations. Panama, a country three times smaller than Guyana, has 12 interconnected sites just run by the Smithsonian Institute alone. Both countries represent 60% of the size of Guyana. So Guyana deserves more. Sophia Point hopes to add to that effort, working together, of course, with others who have blailed at trays long before us. And the standout, of course, is the wonderful Irakrama, with its 370,000 hectares of rainforests. It will continue, of course, to be the preeminent center of Guyana's research constellation. But Guyana does need more, and I hope more join the family of research centers across the country. And as the government has rightly recognized in their low carbon development strategy, capacity must be built to deliver a sustainable future for Guyana's rainforests. And Sophia Point hopes to achieve that through col collaboration, not competition. Working together with the likes of the Protected Areas Commission, the Guyana Marine Conservation Society, the South Rupununi Conservation Society, WWF and CI, and many, many more. Friendly faces, which I see in the room today. Together, I hope we can help transform Guyana into the interconnected set of environmental research, education, and conservation centers of excellence that it deserves. Sophia Point is just two and a half hours from Georgetown at the confluence of the Essequibo, Mazaruni, and Cayuni rivers set amongst hundreds of miles of unbroken rainforest. And the center will make the environment more accessible providing a platform for students, particularly academics and researchers, to study this overlooked and undervalued country, a location which offers potential for terrestrial, freshwater, and marine research, but also a site to facilitate education beyond the biological sciences, to engage with local and indigenous communities, music and arts, and to tie into the existing vibrant and committed community of conservationists in Guyana, amplifying efforts already underway. 
To facilitate that, we're building a solar-powered, environmentally conscious center to host teaching, training, and research at Sophia Point, and of course, to support the local neighborhood, the Riversview community, and I see the two shall hear from that community. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been designed in consultation with academics, field practitioners, and locals to ensure the space will support the best in the field of research and teaching, whilst importantly meeting the needs of Guyanese first. A site to ground learning through doing, to open the doors of environmental science and conservation, and to link Guyanese students, community members, and world-leading academics together. From the start, it's been a priority that Sophia Point is not about Western scientists flying in to Guyana and flying out of Guyana, taking the science with them. We want to help to bring an end to that extractive parachute science model, to build capacity here at the university, at the community at all levels, so that, that the community understands the solutions of the future. And I know some of the children from our neighborhood Amerindian community, Riversview, are here today. And it's for them that Sophia Point can represent a life-changing opportunity at a time when climate change and biodiversity loss threaten the region. We want to put the focus back to the rainforest and its immense benefits. And I'm in no doubt that there can be no solution to the climate crisis that is not dependent on inspiring, articulate and passionate young people from countries like Guyana to help shape future solutions. It is for those young people here in Guyana that the Sophia Point Centre was conceived. Now feels like an immense time of change in Guyana. And we have the opportunity to do something rare in environmental efforts, to take action to prevent rather than cure, and to deliver a transformation in how we live alongside nature. I believe that that's only possible through education, advocacy, and empowerment. A better studied, better understood, and better protected rainforest is for the benefit of all in Guyana and South America, the Caribbean, and beyond and the Sophia Point Rainforest Research Centre offers to be a part of that, a project with a small footprint, but we hope an outsized impact. We're excited to be launching that today and so delighted that Mr. President and Mr. Former Prime Minister have joined us for the launch. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable David Lamy. And we are quite gratified and excited by the prospects of what this project brings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the main event that everyone is waiting for, please welcome first on the stage His Excellency, the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali. Thanks to you, Excellency. And now, please welcome the Right Honorable uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Blair. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Please sit down. So we've lost already about 20 minutes, but time flies when you're having fun. So we'll try to keep uh, on time. And so welcome, welcome again to the University of Guyana. And Mr. President, it is a great honor, I guess, for the country and for yourselves to be the first president to welcome a British prime minister on Guyanese soil. So we thank you for doing that. And I'd like to ask you what you would 
have liked to achieve by inviting uh, Mr. Blair to Guyana? Well, the Right Honorable Tony Blair is no stranger to this region and Guyana. Uh, in his life uh, as Prime Minister, he would have been associated with many decisions and issues that the region itself confronted and by extension Guyana confronted. Today Guyana is positioned in a place where we will, not a place where we can, a place where we will provide tremendous global leadership in the areas of food security, climate change, and energy security. And these three areas are important areas for uh, the Right Honorable Tony Blair. He has launched an international uh, foundation doing work on increasing governance uh, efficiency, reliability, working on global policy making, and transitioning, uh, working in helping to transition developing economies into the new world. And the new world is going to be highly complex and different. So it is in that context that I welcome uh, a friend of Guyana. Uh, we met in the UK and we had elaborate discussions on how we see the future. We exchanged ideas. And I think we are at a point now where we can say our views align on the common platform in which Guyana must present itself globally. So it's in that, it is in that context that I welcome him. And I know for sure this will be one of many, many trips to Guyana in the future. Thank you. Mr. Blair, welcome to Guyana. You've already been beautifully welcomed by our president. Well, to welcome from the university. Uh, what is it that you expect to achieve, and what brings you here specifically? Well, first of all, um, thank you for the invitation to come to University of Guyana, and um, thank you very much, Mr. President, for, for being here, here with me. I, I only got to know the president relatively recently. Um, he has a lot of energy. <laughs> right. I mean, I used to think I was quite dynamic, but I think he is. I've met my match. He's a Mr. Dynamo. You're <laughs> it's, too kind. <laughs> no, it's, uh, which is fantastic for the country, obviously. So it's a great pleasure uh, to, be, to be here with the president and to meet him and his colleagues. Um, of course, it's a privilege to be with David as well, because um, it's, a, it's a marvelous initiative, the Sophia Point Research Center. I mean, it's such an important thing for, for, for us to learn the lessons of the rainforest, and I know we'll, we'll come to that a little later. But um, he can't say this because you should never be complacent in politics, but I have every hope and desire that he will be the British Foreign Secretary at some point next year as well. So, um, and I should say, Welcome, obviously, to Nicola, uh, his, his wife, and, and to, to Baroness Amos, who is, was someone of enormous help and support to me when I was in government. I've only just recently realized the influence of Guyana on British politics, by the way. <laughs> you know, I, I was mentioning when we got to know each other. Reverse swing bowling. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But it's, and I would say, at least, He's from Guyana, and then uh, she's from Guyana, and then they're from Guyana. Yeah, so, yeah, you've got a lot of influence on British politics. Anyway, what brings me here is a very simple thing, which is this country has come through some very difficult times back in the 1990s, very tough economic situation, a country that was very poor at that time, had to stabilize itself. In 2009, came out with a remarkable initiative really, on, the, on the, the low carbon development strategy in the rainforest. And, and then, in one of these strange <laughs> twists of fate, um, is destined now to become a major oil and gas producer. So I think Guyana, because of the, the enormous opportunity and the consequent challenge, and the way the government's approaching it, which is very careful, and deliberate and learning the lessons of similar countries that have been through 
these types of process and how they avoid the errors and embrace the successes. I think Guyana is going to be one of the most, if not the most exciting place on the planet to be in the next few years. So to be, um, to be understanding of that journey and part of it would be a tremendous honor. Thank you very much. We happen to agree that Guyana is already one of the most exciting places to be on the planet. <laughs> Mr. President, since 2009, when the first low carbon development strategy was published, environmental protection has been explicitly at the heart of Guyana's national agenda. And when you took office in 2020, your government immediately sought to update the low carbon development strategy and undertook an extensive set of consultations. Why have you placed such a priority on the low carbon development strategy? And what lessons did we learn from those consultations? Well, first of all, I think uh, our priority on the environment and climate change is part of our global responsibility. We do, we do not see ourselves in an eggshell in Guyana. We understand the importance of our forests for life in the global community. We understand the significance of the forests for biodiversity studies and uh, for the advancement of modern medicine and research and development. And importantly, we know for a fact the value of that forest and the value of the forest not done, but the value of the forest standing. And that is why today we have one of the lowest deforestation rate in the world. And understanding that value and what it brings not only gives us the uh, good international branding of having a forest that contribute to humanity and contribute positively uh, in the climate change equation, but having a forest now that has economic value, staying standing, has financial value, staying standing, and then deploying a strategy and deploying a vision that will realize that economic and financial value, whilst at the same time keeping the environmental and the the biodiversity value, the ecosystem value alive. So I think it's a, a perfect marriage of having all these uh, important ingredients for national development and global sustainability in one package. And that is why I think the LCDS is important. And uh, now we are part of a partnership with the UK. By the way, we, have, we are co-chairing a global initiative with the UK on the carbon market, providing leadership, and you'll hear more of that at COP28. But we are now in a position, uh, you know, when you have Formula One race, you have the pre-race to see your pole position. We are uh, in leadership position when it comes to the forests and carbon at, at COP28, and we'll have a, a major event at COP28. But the LCDS brings together all of these components. And then the consultation. We cannot build a sustainable low carbon development strategy without the custodian of that, of that strategy. First and foremost, the custodian is our Amerindian people, the indigenous people who naturally, naturally understand the value and protect that value. And we should give them a big round of applause. Then we have the wider stakeholders, the consumers of the forest, those in the forestry sector, the mining sector, those in education, the University of Ghana, research and development, and then our international partners. And bringing together all of them in this equation, this consultative equation in understanding first the importance, then the value, and then doing something about the importance and the value, and that is what is critical. Consultation allows us to develop the framework that would push people into action in doing something about value and importance. And uh, one, one, just one addition. In the LCDS, and this is why uh, 
my good friend David, this project is so critical. The ecotourism product that we are going to develop is going to be second to none. But why is it going to be second to none? Because in that pro product, inherent in that product, must be an educational component. And these are the facility that would allow us to build education into that product. That, that is what is going to separate it and make it different from any other product. Thank you. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Happy to hear about education anytime. And Mr. Blair, when you were prime minister, you would now say your, your campaign slogan was education, education, education. Would you now say that it's environment, environment, environment? And if you would say so, and if you would agree, why would you say so? Well, I better be careful of my audience here, but, um, and I'm inclined to say that both are e equally important. I still think that actually the education also leads to better environmental protection because people then understand the importance. And I, I do, especially as we're in a university, I better not uh, downgrade the importance of education. <laughs> um, so I think the thing is, if you look around the world today, the countries that succeed and the countries that, that fail, the education of the people remains the single biggest thing you can do for the success of a nation. Because Technology today is mobile and obviously developing in the, in the most extraordinary pace. Financial capital is, is mobile, it looks for returns around the world. But the people are the people. And as Guyana develops and develops rapidly, the education of the people will become dramatically important. Yeah. Right. It will literally be the, the difference between success and failure for the future. And an educated people, the great thing about education today is that it's got to be education for the open mind. Okay. When I was at school, right, it was, you know, we used to learn all kings and queens of, of England. It didn't do me a lot of good, frankly, in later life but, um, to know this information. But, you know, you learned everything by rote. And you were expected to pass your exams. And it was all just about really passing the exam. But today, education is about teaching people to be creative and to be open-minded. Because when you think about it, you know, the information, you don't, in my day, you got that from the teacher. But today, the information's there. It's everywhere on the internet, right? Yeah. The most important thing is that you're able to utilize that information and that you'll be able, you're able to think creatively and constructively about the world around you and that you're open-minded. So the more educated the people, the more open-minded they are, right? Because they realize today, you've got to go across the boundaries of race and culture and ethnicity. Okay. All of that, I think, is very clear. But the link with the environment is that you then understand that it's not just about increasing the wealth of the country, but it's also about playing your part in the world, realizing that you have here this enormous global asset, which is your rainforest, and being prepared not just to use it as, of course, an important carbon sink, which it is a major carbon sink, but what was interesting about the presentation that, that David gave, and what the president has just said, is that it also is going to allow us to learn a lot about nature, about disease, about genetics, all of which will tie in with technology, but you need an educated people in order to be able to develop that fully. So I think, you know, it's, it's I, still th I still think if I, it, it, if you focus on education, 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 you'll end up with environment, environment, environment. That's what I'd say. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and we're going to print that and put that up somewhere at the university. If you focus on education, 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 you're going to end up with environment, environment, environment. Wonderful. So the president just spoke at length, and I'm sure he could have gone on and on because this is a big agenda for Guyana, about our low carbon development strategy. Uh, what do you think this legacy uh, of Guyana will be, this environmental legacy will be? 
of the, of the low carbon development yes, strategy. Yes, but of Gu the, the, the strategy, but also of Guyana's, all of Guyana's efforts in regard to the environment. Yeah, you see, I think you're in a very strong leadership position on this because you're one of the very, very few countries in the world that have actually preserved their rainforest. And um, the president referenced earlier the COP28 um, meeting that will happen in, in Dubai towards the end of the year. And you know, we need to develop the, the, we need to develop a low carbon strategy that allows the protection of the rainforest to be fully recognized because it, you know, here there have been extraordinary efforts to preserve it, but we're aware that elsewhere that has not happened. And it's partly not happened because people have felt there's a clash between the interests of development and the protection of the environment. And we have to create the mechanism by which that, that supposed contrast between, you know, do you, do you develop or do you protect the environment is eliminated. And that's where this low carbon development strategy is important because it's, it's worked for you over the years, but it can be developed over the next years if we get the right propulsion from the COP28 into something very, very big, which will be, a, by the way, a huge economic asset for the country, billions, billions of dollars worth, but of course protect the environment at the same time. And that's why the, the position of this country in leadership terms at COP will be extremely important. And I think one thing that is remarkable, given that it was done in 2009, when frankly it was quite difficult to do a, a strategy like that, is that you're, the president will be able, with his team, to come to COP and speak from a position of credibility. Mm -hmm. And frankly, in the climate debate, that's uh, it's quite a rare commodity. <laughs> yes, indeed. So uh, the, you and the president are expected to be at COP28 in, at UAE. Um, what do you believe would be the greatest uh, potential of your presence being there? And Mr. President, what would you uh, look to achieve from that being at that summit? Well, first of all, uh, uh, Dr. Paloma, you know, I am from a region, the CARICOM region, and I do not see our prosperity separate from CARICOM's prosperity. And I'm deeply troubled at the circumstances before us in CARICOM. The debt burden, uh, rising interest rate for development financing, the climate vulnerability, these are key issues that we face as a region. And we must be able to make progress on these issues at COP28. We must be able to deal with the Climate Vulnerability Fund. We must be able to deal with the reform of the financial system to address uh, climate vulnerability and climate financing. We must be able to find a formula through which we raise the pledge resources for adaptation. Uh, these are first and foremost on my mind as a regional leader. And championing these regional issues is key for me and for Guyana. Because as Guyanese, I, I always say, we must never ever forget that we are part of a wider collective whole. And we must always definitively and openly and honestly represent that collective whole, even when we believe that, uh, you know, where in the past we were dealt a bad hand, that's the past. It is now about us utilizing our position to benefit the collective whole, and that is what is important. Then from a country perspective, I think the LCDS and the forest is key. We have, in less than three years, successfully, and I want to recognize some of the staff here who are working in that unit. We have Kevin Hogan, Pradeepa. Uh, we have successfully been able to put back forests on the agenda and to develop back that global coalition in ensuring that 
the value of the rainforest and the importance of the rainforest in the conversation is not only understood, but that there's a structure now in place that would look at the market, the carbon market, that, that would look at the true value of that market and move from a voluntary market to a very structured market. So those are the things we're championing. We have a champion next to, next to me here on these issues too. And we have been working aggressively, building partnership to champion this. But as I am at the university, I want to make one important point and link it to what you're doing. In education, Dr. Paloma, you have a word called standardization. I know it because my mother was in testing and development and that word was a prominent word in the house, <laughs> standardization. There's an interesting reality before us, and I want us to understand this reality. The inequality between countries first came about when mechanization came. Those who could have afforded mechanization went ahead and built their competitive capacity. Those who could not afford it were left way behind. There is something emerging that is called AI. You can have the same quality and the same standard of education delivered from a non-human in every school. So the same education given to every single child through AI. Now that brings an interesting question. What is the future of human beings? And the regulations are coming for AI. Very important question, what is the future of human beings? What AI cannot do is research and development. So now, it can gather information, but innovative research and development is still, and from all that I see, will remain a human endeavor. And that is why these facilities are important, to feed into AI. But I want this group of very prominent people to understand that the world we're going to live in 2030 and beyond is going to be very, very, very different. With digitization and AI, the next big question is what is the role, role, what will be the new role of humankind and human beings? Thank you. Thank you. And you, you're spot on, Mr. President, because the University of Ghana, you'd be very pleased to know, has one of the first AI academic policies in the region Sorry. because we are not technology averse. We are grappling with these questions. Mr. Blair, what would you like to, if you can, add to the agenda that the president just set out? What would you look to achieve at COP28? Yes, so first of all, um, I think this COP is an opportunity to deliver some things that are going in truly practical terms to make a difference. I mean, after you've been in politics a, a long time, the words that you dread most are pledge and promise. Because <laughs> <laughs> yes. right? the pledges are very easy to make, um, and the delivery of them seems always to be very hard, right? So people have been making pledges and promises around climate change for a long time. But I think there are two absolutely essential things. The first is to get, a, to get the right framework for climate finance. Because here's, here's the problem that you have on climate change today. The developed world, the West, right? Europe, America, the developed countries of the world have created the problem. But in the future, as the developing world grows, particularly China, India, Southeast Asia, by 2030, the combined emissions of America and Europe will be roughly 20%. The combined emissions of India and China and Southeast Asia, excluding India, will be almost 70%, right? But these countries have got to grow. This is why Guyana is such an interesting country, because you're gonna have to develop Right? You will have the capacity to develop with the oil and gas industry, but at the same time, you want to be responsible stewards of the environment. So you, in a way, here almost personify as a nation the dilemma that the world has. So how do you get your way out of it? Because as I always say to people, you can't tell countries they can't develop. 
You know, my institute works in countries all over the world. We do a lot of work in Africa. These countries have got to develop. So, for example, they need to use gas as a transitional fuel, and anything else is just completely, you know, unrealistic. So, how do you finance that energy transition? Now, I hope that this COP comes out with some a significant and improved framework whereby the developed world realizes its job is to help that process of financing the energy transition in the developing world. That's the first thing. The second thing is precisely to echo what the president just said around technology. I mean, I think this uh, generative AI, which has just you know, come about really in the last year or so, I think it's a revolutionary technology. And it's going to change everything. And someone described it to me the other day in these terms. They said, at the moment, it's like someone with an average IQ looking at a problem, but with 300,000 years of experience. In other words, with the, all of the experience of human existence. So average IQ, but massive experience gives you a lot. But he said to me, the next iterations of generative AI, you'll have an IQ of 150. And the one after that, an IQ of 200, right? And then you're going to be in a completely different world. It's another reason, by the way, why education is so important. Because in the end, the human mind has got to understand this, master it, and then harness it. And one of the ways it can harness it is in research and development because it will give you the opportunity, for example, in areas to do with climate change, to look at new solutions, new solutions to deal with demand as well as supply in areas like nuclear fusion. So there's a whole range of opportunities that's going to open up to us. But it all depends on getting a, the right framework in place. And that framework's got to be practical. And it's got to mean that People, whether they're in the developing world or the developed world, think there is a way that they can solve this problem by practical, intelligent means. And if we do that at this COP, and the leadership, as I say, of Guyana is going to be very important, but the UAE, I know, is a, as a country, is focused on delivering that practical set of solutions. But this is the moment when you've got to move out of pledges and promises to practical action, because it's only that in the end that will solve the problem. Thank you very much. And we will certainly be rooting for you and the president at UAE and everyone uh, who is working on this problem, including some of our top scientists here, like Dr. Paulette Bino, etc. So we're running out of time. This is a very illuminating conversation, but there is a time limit. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to ask now for the audience questions. Uh, could I ask Melinda Pollard, uh, Tusha of Riverview Community? Um, is she going to come up here and ask the question, or am I as asking it for her? Yes, she's in front here. Go ahead, Ms. Pollard. You can stay, you can stay there and answer, uh, ask right. a question. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I'm Melina Pollard, Tushau from Riversview, and also core exec from the National Tushau's Council. So my question is that based on the carbon credits, indigenous peoples have been getting funds that have transformed the villages and also the lives of the persons in those villages and Guyana as a whole. My question is, what importance, if any, is accredited to the indigenous peoples for protecting our pristine environment? Thank you very much. What importance do you give to indigenous communities for protecting the environment? Well, as I said earlier, it is not an issue of importance. You are the custodian. You are the foundation. You are the rock. So it is beyond importance. You are structurally, physically, practically integrated into this product, the LCDS and the environment. 
So it is of utmost importance, our indigenous people and the Amerind in this, in this environment project. And let me say that importance is demonstrated in the formula that the government is using in the disbursement of the resources. There is absolutely no other place on earth where you have, first of all, there is no other forest that has advanced to the stage where we have advanced in earning and selling carbon. One, in a bilateral arrangement, and two, with an end user oil company, and I think we should applaud that. And the second thing is, there is no other jurisdiction where 15% by formula, without question, 15% of the earning is extracted and disbursed directly to the Amerindian communities to fulfill not our development priorities, but your development priorities. It also helps you to improve your capacity in management, in accountability, building your capacity, improving the livelihood options, and expanding the economic base of your community. And we see ourselves in government as a facilitator of this whole process. That is our role, facilitating, just like we have a role to create opportunities for wealth creation. The government has no role in running the business, but in opening the doors. And that is where our role ends, facilitating you. You have to be responsible for the decisions of the community and also in the use of the resources. But I say that you are an integrated part of the whole. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to comment or? I think he said comment. it better than I can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So the next, we have a student from the University Center for the Study of Biodiversity, um, Eric Stahl. Uh, are you here? Uh, yes, good morning, Eric. everyone. Uh, my question to both of the speakers is, is there necessarily a balance between development and protection of the environment? Or do you have to trade off one in order to have the other? OK, so let me repeat. Um, is there a way to balance development and environmental protection, or is there a trade-off? Do we have to trade off one against the other? Um, well, I think, as I was saying before, if there isn't, we're, we're all in trouble. <laughs> because, um, you know, we should just take a step back and, and think about the enormous needs there are still in the world. You know, hundreds of millions of people still have no access to basic sanitation, electricity. We were just talking about the importance of the technology revolution. Well, if you're not connected to the internet, you're not part of that revolution. And, you know, when, when I look at the world today, and you realize how, even though there is substantial development and countries like China and India have lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, they've only done it by developing. Okay. So <laughs> we know that this has got to be, you know, there is no, you, you will never get a solution to the problem of the environment by telling people they can't develop. Okay. So this is why it's so important that the world comes together on this issue. And here's my sense from the geopolitical point of view. We live in a world today that obviously, for very obvious reasons I won't go into, there's, there are a lot of divisions. And the geopolitics of the entire 21st century is changing. Right? Everything used to be dominated by the traditional Western powers. That's no longer going to happen. We live a, we're going to live in a multipolar world. Whatever disagreements there are on certain issues, for example, between America and China, you've got to reserve some area for global cooperation on issues like the environment that matter so deeply. And whatever, you know, whatever problems you have that are in the realm of confrontation, we can't solve climate change 
without developing technology, and we can't develop the technology unless countries like China and India are part of the solution. And this is why it's, it's you know, the question is the question at the heart of the whole COP process. And the problem has been that over the past two decades, I would say, people have either been for the environment or for development. It's so obvious that you have to combine the two, but it won't happen in my view unless we understand that at a certain point, if we really consider the interests of humanity, whatever disagreements you have, whatever fractures and breaks you have in the international community over various issues that of course are important, on this issue of the environment, the world's got to stand together or it will fall together. Yeah. I, 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 just, I just want to add Guyana example. It's very important, please. I, I think it's a very, 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 very good question. But I want my friend to understand a few things. And Prime Minister spoke to it. Just to achieve four of the SDGs by 2030, which is sustainable energy, uh, water and sanitation, safe cities, among the four. CELAC requires two point, the CELAC region requires $2.3 trillion of investment. That is the financing gap. That is the financing gap of achieving these essential SDGs by 2030 in CELAC. And no one knows where that money is coming from. That is a development challenge. The second issue, let's take our country, Guyana, as an example. I mean, we are blessed with a lot of natural resources. But if you have a country with a standing forest, and there is no market for the standing forest or what is standing, the value of the standing forest, the people in that country still have to eat. The people in that country still requires development. Then what decision confronts the people of that country? So what is very critical, as all the studies would have shown, the IMF said it, that for us to achieve the transition we want in energy, and for us to achieve the shift in development focus, the carbon price now should be $70 per ton, 70 US dollars per ton. It is not even $7. And that is why the market is so important in market mechanism. We have to fix that fundamentally. Unless we are able to fix the fundamentals this question and this balance would continue to confront us. How is it we're going to get the world to agree that the price for carbon credit based on what we want to achieve, net zero, must be $70 today? Are we willing to make that bold and important decision? Thank you. Well, I'm sure the students would love to debate you on that, but I can't entertain it. Uh, the lovely John is going to start waving at me in a minute and saying we're out of time. So the final question is from uh, Rihanna McCoy. Yes, she is a student and member of the Caribbean Youth Environment Network. Uh, Rihanna? Good morning, everyone. My question to our speakers is, with what voice and action can young people have when it comes to env the environment when companies and countries are so powerful and individual action is seemingly insignificant? Thank you. Okay, very good question. So what can young people do? It seems that the voices of everyone else is powerful and theirs is insignificant. Excellent question. But, Maybe the young president can answer. <laughs> well, let me start by, by trying to dissect a component of the question. You said powerful countries and people. Well, the nature and environment shows us that no one is really powerful. Look at the wildfires that we're having. Look at the Category 5 hurricane. If you think you're powerful, stand up to a Category 5 hurricane. And that, that kind of uh, equate everything, uh, normalize everything in the world. So young people are the future. Young people are 
that important voice that is not only critical to the equation, but is about your survival. What, is, what world you want to live in? Are you going to even live in a world? What sustainable future you have? What are the prospects? And you know, uh, a former prime minister, very, very internationally recognized prime minister told me recently, boy, I don't know about you, but I ain't want to live in this new world. And he was speaking specifically about digitization and AI. Because for politicians, life has just gotten much, much more interesting. Uh, so young people are an important component of the equation. Not only your voices, your action, what you do, but importantly, how we are changing our culture and how we are changing our approach as young people. And notice I say we, so I'm, uh, <laughs> yes. I, I'm taking you up, uh, Vice Chancellor. So are we changing the way we approach life based on the challenges of the environment and climate? Let's look at Guyana. We understand what littering does. We understand what plastic does. Are we now changing our life habits so that we can live a sustainable future? Are we ensuring that our education program and profile changes our thinking process so that we can not only talk about a sustainable future, but we now have to start living a sustainable future? Thank you. Thank you. Would I talk? So I think to echo what the president just said, I mean, it's a really good question, but I think you're still in charge of your own destiny in this world. Now, there are two things that are happening that you can't do much about, whether you're Guyana or whether you're Britain. The first is this geopolitical rivalry, right? That's gonna carry on. And frankly, whatever Britain says or Guyana says about this, America, China, this probably, look, I think by the middle of this century, you're going to have two, possibly three giants in the world, right? America, China, probably India. By dint of their size of population, the size of their economy, their technology, their military, they're gonna be more powerful than any other country. Then you're gonna have some tall countries. I call the tall countries the ones with populations like Indonesia, over 200 million and so on. Brazil, another tall country. And then you've got the medium-sized and the smaller countries. But frankly, the giants are so much larger one of the things I've noticed about the world is why CARICOM is now of increasing importance to you is that people are realizing in a world that's going to have giants in it, if we want to still have some purchase on that system, we've got to come together in our regions. That's why ASEAN is doing so well. Yeah. That's why CARICOM is important. I'm going to pass over Britain and Brexit. Uh, <laughs> but... but you know, around the world, regions are coming, coming together. So that's, but you know, in the end, it's gonna be a fight, because these giants are giants. And my experience of politics is the very highest level is that giants sit on people smaller than them, just the way it is. The second thing is the technology revolution. And that, again, you can't, you can't affect the fact that it's happening, it's happening. And, you know, you're a young person, so this is good for you. For people my age, never mind, the president's much, much younger than me, obviously, but it's tough. Right. I grew up in a world without mobile phones. My 23-year-old my son thinks this is like the Stone Age. I mean, how did you people live with there was no mobile phones? Well, we, you know, we managed, actually. But recently, I, I was asked to give a speech uh, at a conference on cryptocurrency. And so I got in touch with my, my eldest son who's in the technology business. I said, tell me about cryptocurrency. So he tells me. I said, I, I don't understand it. <laughs> so he said, okay. He then sends me this thing called the Idiot's Guide to Cryptocurrency. <laughs> I read it and then realize that I've attained a higher level of idiocy because I don't understand that <laughs> either. And then finally on the morning of the speech, I phone him and say, look, why not I tell these people about cryptocurrency? He says, tell them you're sick. 
<laughs> You're not fit to go in front of that audience, Dad, believe me. So anyway, so it's tough, but technology is going to happen. But the third thing about the world, which you notice looking around the world, is you are still in charge of your own destiny. You know, countries succeed or countries fail, usually because of themselves. So we can look at these big changes in the world and think they're awesome and somewhat frightening and somewhat disturbing. But in the end, if a country has the confidence and the sense to take good decisions, as I think these guys here are trying to do here, if, it, if you make the most of what you have and you do it in a way that is inclusive of everybody, that involves all parts of society, and that's why the one guy on a thing, such an important concept. If you do that, believe me, you will succeed. No matter the geopolitics, no matter the technology revolution, indeed in the end, you can become a symbol and a signal to the rest of the world about how you can govern yourselves well and live better. Thank you. And uh, I want to know if you listen to Bob Marley. So he has a, a saying, the greatest man you ever did see in this life was once a baby. They were young. And so you build your voice from now. <laughs> OK, um, I am conflicted. I am being told we could take one more question. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, by wonderful. chance, I, I want to add something to, to my, my friend, sure. uh, the right honorable Tony Blair. He said something about the end. And I, re I recall the movie I saw, uh, the Marigold Hotel. And the young guy said, someone was complaining about the problem. And he said, listen, in the end, everything will be OK. And if it is not OK, it is just not the end as yet. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, so one more question. Uh, who is it going to be? Somebody in the back has their hand up. Uh, over there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Please introduce Dan. yourself and say who you are. Tracy Shams Dean. I'm Dr. Josh Kanai from the President's Suite Advisory Council. Okay. Okay, I understand that this is the question and answer segment but I wanted to speak on behalf of the Youth Advisory Council to say how much we commend this initiative and we are zealous about the benefits that will stream to Guyana and the globe and to say how enthusiastic we are about the research in areas such as enhancement in medicine, understanding our rainforest culture and species and also reducing global emissions and by extension global warming and i want to thank the teams on behalf of the youth council and the individuals who are instrumental in making this project a reality josh will now ask the question <laughs> well thank you right so we uh, managed to get a bit more time just to ask our two honorable gentlemen two honorable guests that uh, Given the, the scope of research into our Amazon rainforest and its medicinal values, uh, what are some of the policy directives we can see taken immediately to regularize and standardize the re research uh, medicinal values of our forests? And also, if we can also look at an immediate step towards notarizing and journalizing all of our medicinal values as a first research. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, I think uh, David said it well. I, I think David left. Uh, so one of the things that is different with what David is doing here is local content, building local capacity, integrating local researchers with what we do. And one of the things that we have not benefited from is externalizing our intellectual work. And this is why the University of Guyana is so important. When we externalize our intellectual work, we are externalizing the results of that work. <clears throat> and the results of that work is what lead innovation, is what create business opportunity. So one of the things that we are doing, we are going to do as a country very soon, is that we are working uh, to develop an innovation center where the work from research and development moves into innovation, and then innovation moves into product, and product moves into market. 
there must be a clear line of possibility. Research uh, without action is dead. Research is not meant to be on shelves. You know, we have this uh, prehistorical view that research is meant to be on shelves. Research is meant to influence change. Research is meant for development. It is meant to create uh, opportunities. And that is what we have to do. The question is, what do we do, what will we do with all the material that will come out of this research center? How do we ensure that that material creates possibility, contribute to the science, contribute to biodiversity? And you know one of our policy position is to create Guyana, to, to position Guyana as a global uh, uh, location for the study of biodiversity, ecosystem, and importantly, pharmaceuticals. Our forest has tremendous potential in pharmaceuticals. The indigenous community has already taught us that they have survived on the pharmaceutical values of the forest in what we term traditional medicine, uh, or some people will say bush medicine. But traditional medicine in Asia and in China is increasing its market share and value. And innovation is going to help that. And research is the fuel for innovation. So that is, that is how the policy will be shaped. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would wish on behalf of the university to thank His Excellency and the Right Honorable Prime Minister, former Prime Minister, and to now move into the unveiling of the plaque for uh, Sophia Point. It's a very simple uh, moment. I think we're just going to lift this piece of cloth up here. <laughs> Might I invite uh, David and Nicole and our special guests to please be part of this moment. Excellency. Uh, we were supposed to hand over a gift on behalf of the university. Of course, books. Uh, might we ask that the audience remain seated until His Excellency and the former Prime Minister leave. Thank you very much. <laughs> 